Well, as Tim just mentioned, uh, John Mark's going to come and share the, the message with us. And he's been here several times before. We really appreciate you uh, helping us out. And so, uh, uh, Brother John Mark, please come share. Thank you. Mission moment. I know that Hermano uh, David Martinez up in uh, Northern Heights in Norfolk has done a beautiful job of coordinating that work up there. I know the passion of his heart to do outreach, and yet there's missions is also about the neighbor across the street, right? The neighbor across the street who has COVID, the neighbor across the street who doesn't know Christ. That is missions too. We have to think about far, far away and very, very close, but missions is what we are about and one of the things that I see is one of the hallmarks of our great Baptist work. Today, you were supposed to get this, okay? This is kind of a comic book thing, right? If you didn't get one of these, talk to an usher and get one, okay? This is a graphic design thing talking about Proverbs 31 that my son did about 20 years ago, about 20 years ago. My son is now serving as a deacon with one of our sister churches over at Redeemer Church. He's on the platform this morning leading in worship at his church over there. But he is a graphic artist by background, and this is some of his work from way back when talking about what we're going to be talking about this morning. You know, earlier this year, I always had the opportunity, the privilege of being here on Father's Day and got to talk about dads. And that was fun. It was fun to talk about dads. Now, I'm going to talk about moms too somewhat, but I'm not going to just talk about moms. I'm going to talk about women in our lives in general and women because this passage of Scripture is really not focused towards moms. It's really focused towards wives, okay? And it talks about that in the very first introduction. It says, an excellent wife who can find for her worth is far greater than jewels. So we're going to be talking about wives. Now, I have been married for over 40 years now. And uh, <clears throat> Cheryl, raise your hand, tell me who you are. There's my wife. And she, we've been married over 40 years. I have learned a few things about what to buy as far as gifts for the woman in your life, okay? There are some things you do and there's some things you don't. And one, let me tell you what you're not. I'm going to give you some things, guys, that you should not buy for your wife. Number one, do not buy anything that plugs in. Do not buy anything that plugs in because if it requires electricity, it has a utilitarian factor that says something about work. Okay. Just kind of stay away from that. You know, give her, a, give her money. If you, if you really think she wants something you can plug in, give her money and let her decide she wants to do that. Next thing, do not buy clothes from your wife. Oh, my gosh. I started out earlier in our marriage buying clothes for my wife. That was such a, a, a mess. I would buy her these frilly things with lots of lace on them, and she'd go, <laughs> or, you know, you could, chances are seven out of one in 7,000 that you're going to buy the wrong size. You're, if you go, she, you're going to get it home. You're going to say, do I look like a size 16 to you? Or you'll come back or the, she'll say, I haven't been a size six for 25 years. I don't know what, what made you do that. So you just don't buy clothes for your wife. It's just not going to work for you. Avoid buying things that are useful. The new silver polish that they advertise on TV that saves hundreds of hours is not going to win you any brownie points. Do not buy her silver polish. Do not buy her, do, don't buy her a, a vacuum cleaner because a vacuum cleaner, you plug it in and it's utilitarian and it has something to do with work. It's just not the right thing to do. Pick another time to do that, okay. Don't buy anything that involves weight loss or self-improvement. Per she'll perceive a six-month membership to the diet center as a suggestion that she's chubby, okay? You just don't want to go there. Number five, don't buy jewelry for your wife. The jewelry, jewelry your wife wants, you can't afford, and the jewelry that you can afford, she doesn't want. Okay? That's the way it works. Early in our marriage, I used to go down to the pawn shop and buy my wife jewelry. No kidding. No kidding. Did not go over real well. Did not go over real well. Most of the first move we had, she lost all of the jewelry that I gave her during the first year of our, of our marriage. She lost it all. And I basically, after that, said, no more. If she wants jewelry, she'll tell me. She'll just tell me, go there, pay the money. That's what I want. That's what you do, guys. Do not, do not try to buy jewelry for your wife without her help. And guys, don't fall into the traditional trap of trying to buy frilly underwear. Your idea of the kind of underwear your wife wears and what she actually wears are light years apart. Okay? Anything like that, my wife says, it's scratchy, I don't like it, fine. You know, 
that's what we do. Just leave it there. Finally, don't spend too much. How did you think we can afford that, she'll ask. But don't spend too little because she'll think, aren't I worth anything to you at all? So it's, it's kind of a minefield. It's kind of a minefield. But at the same time, this passage of Scripture, Proverbs 31, has something to say to us both as men, guys, I'm talking to you, but it also has something to say to the ladies too, some goals that we have in mind. Remember this was written when? Last week? No. How many years ago? 3,000. About 3,000 years ago, right? 3,000 years ago this was written, and it's still applicable. It still works for us. I want to tell you a true story. There was this wonderful lady. Her name was Susanna. And Susanna had a total of 20 children, 19 children, all of but 10 of them died in childbirth in their infancy, okay? This is back in the early 1700s. Her last name was Wesley. Have you ever heard of the Wesleys? If you haven't, it's about time you learn. Look in your hymnal. There are 20 hymns in your hymnal written by the Wesleys, 20 of them in our hymnal, the one that's in your pew. I just looked it up today. You think I make this stuff up? I don't. Anyway, she had a mess. She had a husband who couldn't handle money well, and he was such a controversial preacher. Half the time, they would, they would burn their houses. They would kill the animals. They literally had two houses burned out from underneath them, okay? Samuel Wesley was a real pro had, had some issues. He ended up in debtor's prison a couple times because he couldn't pay his bills. And his own parishioners didn't really like him very well. Suzanne made a decision, though. She said that for every hour that I do something for myself, I'm also going to spend an hour in prayer. And the only way she could do it was she would take her apron and throw her apron over the top of her head, and she told the kids, if I have my apron over the top of my head, that means I'm talking to God right now. Do not bug me. And it seemed to work because Charles and John Wesley literally shook the world. They literally shook the world. In our, Charles wrote over five, over 9,000 hymns. Several of them we have, like I said, in our hymnal today. John, when he was in his 70s, preached a salvation message to 32,000 people without a microphone. Okay? They rocked the world. The foundation of that wonderful, godly woman in their lives was incredibly powerful. You see? Now, the idea here of working on this is to understand that the, the husband wife relationship is normative. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't exceptions. You know, John Wesley himself was never married, he was celibate, he was, he was a single guy, and he had a gift of, celib uh, of singleness. And I'm not saying that that isn't, isn't a, a real thing. You know, there are a lot of unclaimed blessings out there, you know, and that's okay. Okay? But at the same time, as we look at this passage of Scripture, it's talking about the normative relationship that our whole society is built on, the husband and wife relationship. And it gives us a good idea of what a wife really can and should be. And it's not necessarily what some people in contemporary, Bible, contemporary society think the Bible has to say about it. For one thing, she, we talk about her trustworthiness. We talk about her trustworthiness. If you look in, in verses 10, 11, 12, you can see that there's some really interesting, you see right there, it says, the, the, an excellent wife who can be, an excellent wife, who can be found? She is worth far more than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he has no lack, no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of his life. Okay, this is part of what we see that is the foundation. As a, a, a wife that is a, a wife that is a godly wife is a wife that can be trusted, someone that her husband can rely on, someone that compliments him in so many ways in his life, and someone he can depend on, who helps him to be a better man because he's married to her. It says in Genesis 2, 24, therefore a man should leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall, be, shall become one flesh. You see, that is what sets us apart as we live biblical relationships with one another. We know that the paramount relationship on this earth is not the relationship we have with our parents. That is very contrary to a lot of the societies around us and even in our society today. But the foundational relationship 
is that relationship, that husband and wife relationship. And we should really cleave to it. We should really lean into it. It's a very, very important relationship. Moving on, we talk about the variety of a, of a wife's, shall we say, her grind, her routine, the things that she does, what things that make a woman great, someone who makes her a wonderful wife to other people. Beginning in, in verses 13, and I'll go ahead and re read through 24 for you if I can get through it. Um, I'm dyslexic, so that's always kind of interesting. She looks for wool and flax, and she works with her hands in delight. She is like merchants of sea. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and brings food to her household and portions to her maidens. And she considers a, a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hands to the, to the distance, to the deafest, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow in, in the household, and all of her uh, household are clothed with scarlet. Yeah, she's a corn husker. Just let that sink in. Okay, let me go on. Clothes in scarlet. She makes clothing for herself. Her clothes, her clothes in is her clothing is fine linen and purple. And her husband is known at the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the tradesmen. Wow. This lady is busy, and she is the type of lady that many of us know, right? Some of them we're married to. I can think about when my wife, when we, when we were overseas, we, we lived overseas a total of 14 years, the nine years we spent in Taiwan, and my wife was still doing cloth diapers. She wasn't using disposable diapers. She was doing cloth diapers which meant we had a big pail full of bleach water that we put dirty diapers in, and she'd wring them out and put them in the washing machine. And some of you probably did that too. But that was just one of the many things she did. She also taught graduate school courses at the local uh, technical institute, a graduate program. She taught English classes to graduate students at the same time. She also led the, did the piano and, and, and played music. She can play the piano beautifully in Mandarin like it makes any difference, you know, she, anybody, she, she starts playing, you know, anyway, that's what she did, she, and there was things like this, these are the things that we talk about, what are some of the aspects, some of the things that we see about this lady beginning in verse 13, she works with her hands, at that time, you couldn't run down to Walmart and buy clothes, clothes were really, really expensive, because clothes took a lot of manual labor, and they were very customized, they were very special, right, and so she's involved in working with her hands. She's like merchants. She's bringing food to her, to her household from afar. She's working hard to make sure that there's a balanced and nutritious diet to keep her children healthy, to keep her husband healthy, to keep people moving forward. And that's no small feat back then, but it's no small feat now. It's really easy to fall into the idea of, well, I'll just pit, stop by and pick something up at the Burger Biggie and bring it home in a bag. That isn't necessarily the best and nutritious thing we should do. A good and godly wife a lot of times will be innovative in thinking about how she feeds her family, does the research to figure out what's nutritious, what people should be eating, what will help them with their health. One of the things that my wife does for me every night, she says, John Mark, I've laid out your pills. They're on the counter. Because I'd forget about it, and I wouldn't take them, and I would be the worst for it. Part of the reason why that we haven't had COVID, I believe, is because we've been taking prophylactics, we've been taking preventatives, and we're very faithful about that, and so far, it's been very good for us. We've had the vaccine, but we also are taking prophylactics, and that's helping us, but she's very much a part of making sure that I take those pills when I'm supposed to. That's part of loving me. That's part of taking care of me. That's part of being a good wife, and I appreciate that. It says, she rises while it's still night and gives food to her household. My wife always gets up early. My wife always has her Bible near her. My wife always spends time in the Word. Reminds me of a wonderful story that was, paid, was, was given a few years ago about some scholars that were sitting together talking. There was, a nice, there was some nice 
preachers getting together, and one said, you know, I really love the King James, the authorized version. It's beautiful. It's oratory. It was good enough for Shakespeare. It's good enough for me, you know. And the next guy came back, and he says, I like the New American Standard. It's, that's what I've got right here, the New American Standard. It's so accurate, and it's so perfect in so many ways. The next guy said, I love the, the phrase for phrase, thought for thought translation of the New Living Version. It's a wonderful Bible. And the last guy said, well, I like my mother's translation the best. And the three men turned around and were surprised, and they said, yes, she translated it into life, and it was the most convincing translation that I've ever seen. Okay, That's the kind of person that I think most women want to be. As Christian women, most women want to be a translation of the word in front of their families, in front of their husband, in front of their parents, in front of their children. And I hope that and pray that that's the direction that we all are going. It says that <clears throat> she has portions for her maidens. Now, what are we talking about, her maidens? This woman had one people working for her. She was a manager. The Bible talks about this. There's nothing wrong with people, with women that are involved in business, women that are involved in management. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's very biblical. It's a balanced thing, though. You know, what's interesting is one of the things that's been said lately is that there's a glass ceiling and women can't get above it. And I would argue most of the time what's going on is the women are too smart to try to take those kind of stupid jobs at the top where you work 85,000 hours a week and die young of a heart attack and have no family. Because most business executives in top companies have a mess for a personal life. They barely know their kids. They work too much. They damage their health and are usually on their third wife, okay? That's what goes on. Women are too smart for that, for the most part. They don't do that kind of dumb stuff. It was so interesting because when, when I was a kid, my dad traveled all the time. He was with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and he traveled quite a bit. And that went on and on and on until they started sending women out to do the work. And the women said, no, we're not going to travel that much. We've got families at home. And it took the women starting to do the work to get a little bit of sense in the amount of travel that they did in the occupation. And they got just as much done, and the guys ended up having better home lives because the women got involved in making the decisions in the business world. Does that make sense? Okay. So we see that very clearly here. This woman is a manager. She has people that she works for her. She girds herself in strength, and it makes her arms strong. A godly woman is a woman who cares about her health. A godly woman cares enough about her family that she takes care of her health. That means that she exercises on a regular basis. That means that she makes sure she eats. She makes sure that there's correct boundaries and says, listen, kids, you're going upstairs and you're going to go to bed. Okay? I don't care if you go to sleep or not. Just be quiet because I'm tired and I need a rest. And there's nothing wrong with that. We need to encourage the young people in our life to be respectful of the people who are caring for them and being respectful of their moms. That's one of the things that we can do with, with, for dads when we're working with kids, okay? Her light doesn't go out at night either. The opposite side, my wife is also very good at that. She stretches out her hand and she grasps the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor and stretches out her hands to the needy. Part of a godly woman is someone who realizes that there's always somebody who doesn't have it as good as what we do. Everybody in this country is rich by international standards, right? Everybody in this country is rich by international standards, and that's the truth. Just this week, we were working with a new immigrant couple from Iran, okay? And these are people, they both have PhDs. They both are incredibly educated people. But you know, they are used to living physically on about $45 for their four people in their family. They're used to living on about $45 a week, okay? That's what's normal for them coming from Iran. That's what's normal for them with earned doctoral degrees in front of their name and lots of alphabet soup after their name, okay? So put that in perspective of how excited they are to be here and to be able to get fruits and vegetables and so on, and to watch that young mom do what she needs to do, and for us to minister to them and to care for them. We, we need to be people that are interested in 
the needs of others. And that includes the lady across the street who has COVID, right? It includes the Latinos that live that work in the building right here. They're worshiping in the building right now. It's all of the above. And part of being a godly woman is still, that's very much part of it. She's not afraid of snow for her household. Why? Because she they closes them in scarlet, right? Closes them in scarlet. And I, I, you know, I talked about the Husker thing. But the idea is her kids are taken care of. How many of you been in a neighborhood? I think about my daughter. My daughter lives right around the corner from my son. My daughter is the worship leader at Grace Life Church. She's leading on the platform right now. And she and her husband live right around the corner from my son, okay? But they have neighbors right behind them. They have neighbors right behind them. And she's constantly worried about that little girl over there because there's a lot of times that she's outside with nothing but a diaper on. And and Christine says, my daughter says, what's going to happen in the wintertime? This woman in this passage is not afraid of the snow because her kids are clothed in scarlet. We need to pray for people that they have put these things together, have their life put together. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known at the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. I would argue that some of the very best pastors that I know are in the ministry because of the women that they've married. I would say that that's true with me. I hate to travel. I hate to minister without my wife because she's such a leveling. She's such a a leveling, uh, like leaven in, in bread. She levels me. She keeps me stable. She helps me to see things in good perspective. She gives me moderation sometimes when I need it, okay? And this is is what a wife can do. It happens in business. It happens in families. You know, how many times when the lady passes away, the extended family relationships go all the pot. They, they, they They really fall. They go down. Because so much of these relationships are held together by the ladies, by the women, because they care and they develop those relationships. And they add richness and depth. So it's not just when we deal with business or when we're in church, but it's just in our family relationships that the godly woman that we see here is a woman that her husband is respected because he has the privilege of being married to her. She makes them linen garments and sells them. So you see that the godly woman is someone who's in business, like I said before. She's involved in textile trade. It's okay to be involved in business. We already, and we missed another one here that was very important. She considers a piece of land and she buys it. And from her earnings, she plants a vineyard. Again, she's involved in finance. She's involved in real estate. She's someone, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong. Don't let the feminists tell you different. The Bible is a place that gives tremendous freedom, tremendous opportunity to women and encourages women to have tremendous freedom and opportunity. Strength and diligence are her clothing and she smiles at the future. Why does she smile at the future? Because she knows she's done everything that she can in God's power to make it a happy place to be, the future, you see. She's not afraid of the future. She's looking forward to the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom and teaches of kindness in her, with her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her and her husband also. He praises her saying, many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is fine, but a woman who fears the God, fears the Lord, She is to be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works be praised at the gates. It's all right there, okay? 20 years ago, that's what my dad, that's what my son thought about his mom. And that's what he said yesterday to her too. Let's close in prayer. Father God, I just thank you so much that you've given us such a great outline roadmap for relationships. And Lord, I just thank you so much for the women in my life, my mom, my wife, my daughter, and my granddaughters. And I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to help them to be the kind of women of noble character that you'd have them to be. This I pray in your name. Amen.